call the meeting of the uh, Arlington Finance Committee to order uh, a couple of notes. Uh, I try, if at all possible, to keep one or both of the doors at the end meeting open because this is a public meeting. Uh, it, the only times when we can is if the noise outside is just too bad, and then even then. So uh, uh, I, I leave Gloria is in charge of the doors uh, on that. But anyway, I, I like to try to keep those open. Okay, uh, first order of business is the minutes. Uh, are there any corrections? Charlie. <clears throat> yes, um, Brian Mary's name is misspelled about six lines down where it says late April Brady, which is Rary. And the Community Protection Act should be Community Preservation Act. Same, same line. Okay, there's Peter. Same one over to the right. It says community protection. The line begins with late April. Oh. That's where Brian and everything is missing an R. <coughs> and then over on the right hand side, it should be community preservation. <laughs> I'm sure it's protective too, but. You know. <laughs> okay, uh, Christine. Um, Article 54. It's perpetual care, not permanent care. And, and um, two, uh, three lines after that, uh, voted to transfer 150 from Lawson Gray's fund to DPW Cemetery Division, not Cemetery Commissioners. Okay, uh, So I was here on Monday. Frank Lamont was here. I'm sorry? <laughs> Said Frank Lamont was here on Monday. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> That's okay. Nobody's can. Okay, anybody else? So, uh, Brian. I don't know if Charlie corrected this. I, we just knew here. Um, Rich Visquet, I believe his name is spelled V I S. So it's in, it's throughout here. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, Paul. About two thirds down the first page, it talks about an estimate of 1.26 million Arlington capital assessment. Should that be? Annual Arlington Capital Assessment. That would be more accurate. Okay. Any others? Okay, so uh, do I have a motion? Second. Second. Okay, moved and seconded uh, to approve the minutes as corrected. Any further? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, on the calendar that you have, I was uh, hoping not to have a meeting next Wednesday, but I think we're going, we, we are going to. Uh, the CPA is going to make a presentation to us. I have them down for 735. If we're efficient uh, and get everything done on the 28th, I don't think it'll be a long meeting. Uh, but it is there first, they started late, so I thought we should uh, fit that in and give them the opportunity, and, the, and they're enthusiastic about coming. At least they said that in the mail. <laughs> uh, okay, and then the 13th will wrap up everything. That's when the House Ways and Means Committee is coming out. I confirmed that so we could finalize the uh, final numbers. Uh, Charlie? You wanna? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I sent an email out to the members today and uh, passed out a sheet of paper with a corrected uh, page of the recommended vote. Uh, Paul, thanks for the passing on last week, uh, uh, last meeting. But, um, <clears throat> so the, uh, 
all the other tables and charts that were in the presentation were accurate, and the total number that we voted as a as a tax impact were accurate. Um, we, we just should have not had the six million three hundred nineteen thousand two hundred six dollars as part of the vote because it was already voted. But all of these things are part of the uh, fiscal year seventeen and uh, a budget and the five year uh, capital plan. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, okay, Peter gave a uh, handout on the uh, changes. So the only thing that we have to vote on um, on Article 44 is the Arlington Tourism and Economic Development. Uh, they're doing a presentation at 7:35, Gloria, on, on Monday, um, and we could uh, put this article to bed. Okay. Uh, okay, group health insurance will uh, take care of that later. So the main topic of discussion and presentation today is on Minuteman. Uh, I want to divide this into two separate, in, uh, I want to divide the presentation and all the Q&As into two separate issues. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Minuteman budget. Uh, and then once we've finished all that, we'll go on to the uh, building project. Uh, now the building project, the select uh, um, so have created a, a task force on this, uh, so we're not gonna actually vote on the Minuteman project. Uh, now I'll wait to get the process from a task force. It's sort of a meeting for the last year anyway. Um, and, and I'm on it, and Charlie is on it, and Stephen is on it. Uh, together with uh, one selectman, the manager, uh, the Minuteman representative uh, on the school committee, and so they'll be making a recommendation to that uh, to us. That'll probably be April 13th. Uh, so with that, um, Edward, now yeah. that's not amplified for us. That's for the TV, so you gotta speak loudly. All right. Is that a good sound for you guys? Um, so there's a Minuteman FY17 budget presentation. I'll just go through that. Uh, first, I'd like to say thanks for having us here. I'm here with Kevin um, Mahoney, <laughs> my assistant superintendent. I took a nap before I came here, which was great, but I'm um, forgetting things. First of all, the assessment's down about 300,000 over, over last year, but if you want to go, th we'll go through this fairly quickly and I can take questions. Um, on page one, slide two, um, the uh, the uh, regional agreement was approved, which has had an impact on how we assess folks for next year. Um, the commissioner approved the new regional agreement as of March 11th, and there were components of that agreement which went into place immediately upon approval. And one of them was how we assess um, our towns. And so those revisions are included in this latest assessment uh, from us. On slide three, this is an overview of the changes in the agreement in terms of a four-year rolling average, which we employed um, this year. Uh, the debt assessment was changed, uh, operating assessments. Uh, our guidelines for our FY17 budget that's before <coughs> now is that we uh, wanted to have no net increase in staffing. Uh, we've actually had a reduction in staffing in this budget. Level funding, level dollar funding of all supplies and services and uh, began planning uh, for long-term needs in regards to instructional uh, equipment. One of the things that we've done over the last really eight years is federal Perkins money. We get about a quarter million dollars a year. And uh, when I arrived at Minuteman nine years ago, almost all of it was being spent on personnel. We've been able to wean all the people off of that, and now it's basically 100% equipment, which is what we're gonna, we believe is a real important um, source of funds going forward. Uh, from the feds. Overall, our FY17 budget is 19700000 That represents a, a dollar decrease of a half a percent over FY16. Our assessments, our total assessments to the member towns is about um, $11 million. That uh, represents an increase of half a percent. Uh, when we looked at our revenue plan, we've made uh, a few assumptions and they seem to be holding true. Our Chapter 70 uh, aid increase of 19,000, fairly modest. 
a transportation increase of 115,000. As we're transitioning to a smaller school with fewer out of district students, we've seen a decrease in prior year tuition of almost $972,000. Um, and that caused us in this revenue plan to utilize more of our excess and deficiency account to keep the total assessments to the towns uh, down as far as we could. On page four, slide seven, um, some other considerations in this budget, not knowing right now if we have a full, fully approved uh, MSBA project <coughs> or not. We've allocated $500,000 uh, for debt service. This would be year one of debt service. Um, if the project is not approved, that $500,000 would be reallocated uh, to long-term repair and uh, capital improvement projects for the current building. Uh, we're intending to keep an excess and deficiency balance somewhere between three and a half and four and a half percent. By, by law, we're, we can, we're capped at five percent. Uh, and we're completing some short-term repairs with this budget that we need to in, in regards for access issues to the building, as well as some uh, repaving that we have to do, which would not be undone by a building project. We're also doing some engineering work on our softball field. Um, we just can't put these things off for, in regards to safety and health of kids. Um, in FY17, we're continuing to transition to a smaller school, 628 students. 10% um, of our utility costs are gonna be coming out of our revolving funds. Our revolving funds are where we put all the money we get for rental income, rental of the fields or of different parts of the building. Summer school, we also have some properties, as you know, um, MIT Lincoln Lab uh, rents a um, uh, 16,000 square foot building that we built for them. Uh, the revenue for that goes into our revolving account. So we felt it was uh, the, the Finance Committee of Minuteman and the School Committee agreed that it was um, appropriate to be using some of those funds to offset our overhead and utility costs. We're going to be leasing two school activity buses. And as we transition to an academy model, whether we're in a new building or not, that's requiring some additional professional development. Uh, continuing on slide nine, our health insurance, we're anticipating about a 5% increase. Um, we're transitioning to a self-funded model. We're members of the health trust with four other vocational schools. And a little bit of transition as one of, one of them merged with another school, the Essex Agricultural High School merged with North Shore Regional and uh, Peabody Boat, I believe. And so we're um, um, transitioning there as well. Our general insurance is up about 3%. Uh, we're continuing to uh, fund our stabilization fund. Our school bus transportation contract, uh, which was renewed, um, and we have a new three-year contract, is up about 8%. And as you know, transportation for Minuteman is quite a, a significant expense given the, uh, the width and breadth of our district. <coughs> uh, we're going to continue to fund our OPEB uh, liability with $50,000 out of this budget. Staffing overall is down 11 and a half full-time equivalents in this budget. One administrative position, eight teaching positions, and two and a half uh, paraprofessional or support uh, positions. We've been able to achieve this without active layoffs. We've been very mindful when folks are retiring or transitioning that we not fill positions that we anticipate we will not need um, as we transition to a smaller school in a new building. Enrollment on page six, you can see it right now, we're about 624 high school kids. In addition, we have another 35 to 40 adults. Our freshman class um, this year was about the same. We're seeing some increase in applications for next year. As a matter of fact, we're up about 15% from our member towns um, at this time compared to this time last year. The Arlington enrollment has been up and down. Uh, we have about 33 freshman applications for next year. And then the uh, uh, assessment compared to last year to this year on, on page seven, it's slide 14. Um, you'll see the total assessment of about uh, 3.6 million down $360,000 uh, from the previous year.
And then our budget overall in the last two slides uh, by state function code. Um, you can see a decrease in student instructional services. That's mainly in our uh, reduction in staffing, uh, a reduction in the uh, asset and acquisition improvement. You see that's been moved to the debt service line item for this budget. If the project is not approved, we would reallocate that back to the 7,000 uh, line item. And then our revenue plan, um, and you see the big increase there is from our excess and deficiency appropriation to offset the reduction in out-of-district tuition revenue. So that's a rapid-fire overview of the, uh, the FY17 budget. Um, and I'll take any questions through the chair. Okay, Paul. Well, uh, a couple questions. First off, how many students do you anticipate for next year that this budget is based on? Um, about the same, about 600 and whatever it is. Our, we have, a, uh, our, like I said, our application rate is up, but I really have to rely on the October 1 before we make any budgetary changes. So we're looking at a, a school of about 628 is where we're trying to get to get down to. Um, the second question, if you'll permit me, what is, what is the career academy model? How is that different from how you have been operating? That's a great question. It might be more appropriate in the discussion of the building, but generally speaking, the building's been designed around a career academy model where Minuteman would divide itself, not divide, but uh, organize itself in, in two academies, one being a life sciences and services academy and the other being an engineering, construction, and trades academy. And so all our academic staff have risen their hand and, and, and chosen to be in one of, one of those two academies. And we've been planning for over a year on how we're going to implement this. But the basic um, premise is that all the academics are taught through the lens of the occupational area that the student is interested in. So math is going to be taught in that academy by a math teacher who's assigned to that academy. English, science, and then we have some shared folks, guidance is shared, languages, um, AP classes, obviously we'd have kids from both academies, but uh, the staff's very excited about it. We have a 15-member team. We met today for about the eighth time um, and identifying what our uh, non-negotiable items are, how we can adjust our scheduling next year to incorporate common planning time, which is the core piece of an academy model is that the teachers plan um, and it's uh, the kids have been involved in it as well um, identifying in the building what programs should be adjacent to one another where the academic classrooms should be located where the science class lab should be um, so it's a really a lot of it we do naturally at Minuteman but we're, we're doing it more intentionally more planfully <coughs> and I call it a true academy model um, you know a lot of schools have changed their name to academy but they don't haven't changed the way they do things. So, thank you. That's a long, short answer. <laughs> uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, what's the balance in the uh, uh, e and account, the excess and deficiency account? Uh, Kevin, right now, eight hundred and forty-three thousand. That's after this eight twenty-five was out, or before? Before. So the, when the A25 goes out, it'll be zero. Until we have our new E&D certified, which would be in October, we anticipate uh, being able to replenish that. Uh, what's the, um, what's your OPEB, unfunded OPEB liability? Total? Yeah. I think it's close to 20, 17 million. And how much is uh, funded? In this budget, 50,000. We put 50,000 in it in this current year as well. So, I mean, then it's a short way along the road to funding. You were making tiny steps. Yes. Through almost every year. Is this the first year? Second. Second. Uh, FY17 is the second year. Another question on, on uh, the reduction of your 11.5. 
Yes. Is that going to have an effect on the, uh, what do you call the disciplines or the special things that you offer in the programs? No. Okay. Um, one more question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you said that the, uh, you, you put the funds out there from the D and D account into the because of an anticipated drop in out of district students. So, um, is some, is that going to get made, made up in the future? I mean, is this a do you expect to have additional drops? And how does that look in the future? You only have eight hundred twenty-five thousand or eight hundred fifty thousand in the okay. in your reserve fund. Well, as we move towards a smaller school, we're expecting our operating budget to decrease as well because we're going to have fewer staff through natural attrition. I've mentioned it a few times over the last couple years that right now we're carrying staffing and vocational technical programming that is on a closure plan because it's not part of the new building, it's not part of the educational program plan. So as those programs um, officially close and the last senior graduates, those staff would not be rehired. So we're anticipating some other reductions in operating expense. Whether it will offset the full reduction in the tuition revenue, it's hard to say right now. The commissioner is continuing to lower the rate. I believe next year he hits his 125% level. So we won't see any more reductions in the tuition rate itself. Um, but we could see continued uh, reductions in the amount of non-resident student applications mainly because of a change in the law, which requires those students to, like Medford and Waltham, for instance, they have vocational programs. The students are now required in ninth grade to explore those programs, even if none of those programs are the programs those students want. So they would come to us as 10th graders in that um, world, and we haven't gone through a full cycle of that yet, so we're not really clear but it's had a negative impact on out-of-district applications all across the Commonwealth. Um, and there's five or six other schools that have a significant number. Um, so, so will, you have, will you have or are you planning for an additional reduction in out-of-district students when the capital burden is added to the tuition? We're not anticipating that at this point um, because Although the towns may be unhappy with it, and I know there are several larger sending cities that have uh, threatened legal action against the Department of Education for the institution of this capital plan, it's up to the students and the families themselves if they come. It's not up to the town itself. And so we see a tremendous, we actually see a growing interest from families. I think, I'm hoping at that time, as we bring our operating costs in line with other vocational schools our size, the new buildings online, um, and some other things happen in regards to the property itself, we're going to see some of these larger uh, out-of-district communities actually join. As you know, that was one of the intents of the new regional agreement. The capital fee, I think, just pushes that a little more. Thank you. Other questions? So how many students do you have now? How many within district and how many outside? Uh, I think just high school kids, it's like 225, uh, 625. Total? Yes, and another 40, 35 or 40 adult postgraduate students. Okay, so you've in effect already had the drop. Yes, this, this year was. Because you've lost the ninth grade. You're, yes. you're losing the ninth grade coming in. Yes. Okay, now it's even going to get harder because now they're going to go from eighth grade to a ninth grade high school program and have to break away from that to come here. Socially, emotionally, it's going to be very difficult for a young person to leave once they're established in another high school, whether they're in a vocational program they want or not. I think it was wrong headed decision, but it was the State Board of Education. Okay, other questions? <clears throat> yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Out of the 600 some odd students you have, how many are from the sending towns in the original agreement? Uh, but almost 60 percent this year. 59 percent, I believe. Of the 382. How many? 382. I think that's around 58, 59 percent. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> okay. Thank you very much on that. So, uh, we go to the one we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Uh, building project. So there are two handouts around the building project. One is the presentation, and the other one I'm going to let Kevin explain when I go through the back of the slides. This is how the assessments are done. And we were required to provide uh, MSBA with a FY20 projection, an operating budget um, and, a, and a capital cost. And we've uh, utilize the new regional agreement to develop these, and so we'll go over those in a little more detail, if, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, so I slimmed this down. Uh, Steve DeCourcy uh, suggested that I get away from the 39 slides that I had earlier, which really had a lot of nice pictures in it, though. Mm -hmm. um, so page one, um, this, is what, this is what we're using as a template when we go to town meeting or we go to meetings in towns about the, about the building project. Um, page two, slide three, is just a high level overview of, of the features of the project. Uh, the student design is 628. This is uh, resulting in a school of about 258,000 total gross square footage, um, 119 million of construction costs, 145 million of the total project. MSBA increased their um, original 40% reimbursement rate to 44.75% of eligible costs. Um, and that resulted in a net effective reimbursement rate for this project of 30% or a dollar of contribution from the state of about $44 million. Um, we're also, the building is going to be L LEED Silver certified. The goals of the project overall was to implement, I'm on slide five, page three. Uh, we wanted to implement a research-based, data-driven academy, as I was able to answer earlier. We want to protect our accreditation from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. We want to provide a facility that motivates students to find their passion and purpose, intensifying our career in tech programming with our, I believe it's a very innovative educational plan, and really look at creating a campus, uh, a campus environment that's compelling, and it's also affordable to our member towns. We believe enrollments would increase. This is what we're seeing right now. We're up about 15% from our member towns from last year. That means about 155 applicants, eighth grade applicants for next year. We're seeing increasing elementary enrollment in our member towns. Arlington is, is dealing with that phenomena as well as some other of our member communities, Lexington, um, to an extent Concord and Belmont. We're seeing increased interest in career and tech ed as reported by our member <coughs> town guidance counselors in a survey that was done. Dave Paliogas of DAPA Research did a survey in, uh, back in August of 2015 showing 68.5% uh, support for the building. Only 8.5% were against building a new building. And as we talk with parents around our district, we're really seeing parents start to look at the investment, the return on investment of a career and technical education high school experience and as it relates to what kids do in college, where they go after college and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a picture of the <coughs> campus on slide seven. You can see the new building is proposed on the far western corner of the property. A reminder, <coughs> we have 66 acres there. Um, that is in the town of Lincoln. Um, the next slide is sort of a snapshot of our academies and the programming and the career majors that are offered in each academy, as well as what we call shared services and programming. Some of that will be located distinctly within each academy, and some will stand on its own as it needs to. When we look at it, the, the considerations of a building, when you're designing it on slide nine on page five, 
you're really creating two schools within a school. It's, it's based upon the small school research with some flexible learning areas. Similar curricula is located near each other. We're sharing a lot re more resources. Teachers are really struggling with this idea that they won't have their own classroom, uh, that it's going to be shared spaces. Uh, I think that's causing a little anxiety, but um, collaborative applied learning spaces, practical sustainability, that's mean it's been designed with sustainability in mind, not only in materials and layout, but also in how we use spaces, that they can have multiple uses, they can be um, practical as we go through it. Supporting workforce education, real world project-based learning, and we have spaces in the building that reflect that. We have something called a toil lab. When we went to MIT Lincoln Labs, it stands for Technology Office Innovation Lab. It's where employees at Lincoln Lab can, if they have an idea and want to design a product, they can take it from design to prototype to full production. And we wanted to replicate that because we've seen that in some of our life sciences uh, employers who rep are represented on our advisory committees. And we also have project-based learning space where students from different vocational programs would be able to work on a project, leave it there, um, and, and, and have a space for that. We have some of that now, but it's really an excess space. It wasn't designed on purpose for what we are looking at in the new building. We talk about the need for the building, uh, which most of you are well aware of. Um, we kind of try to overview what we've done with MSBA with a feasibility study that we've looked at many models. Um, as you may recall, when MSBA first invited us into this pipeline, we had two design enrollments, one for 435, one for 800. We had to do uh, an analysis of schools for each of those, um, which was um, renovate only, or renovation, uh, renovation addition, and new for each of those design enrollments. And then we also had a subgroup of our school building committee that looked at uh, let's just let, look at repairing what we have and what would that cost. So we've taken a long time, longer than anybody else in the history of MSBA, to look at these options and the new building was the most uh, least disruptive and most economical. Some folks still um, look at new construction versus a renovation and we sort of highlighted on slide 12 um, what we would get in each of those. In a new construction, we're getting a net reimbursement rate of 30%. If we go to renovation, really what that means is that our building project has failed and MSBA steps away from the plate. And getting back into the MSBA pipeline is, first of all, difficult, takes time. Second of all, if you're lucky enough to get into the pipeline again, your reimbursement rate is a 31% a minimum. We were grandfathered in at a 40% minimum. So that was one of the advantages of taking so long, I guess. Um, we're looking at 10 years of construction to renovate what we have, continual disruption. Um, our building as it is just doesn't fit the educational program plan, uh, higher operating costs. We doubt it would be attractive to students or members. And it just continues the uncertainty, I think, that the district has suffered under for a number of years. Um, Slide 13, we talk about why is Minuteman more expensive? Uh, well, we, we compare Minuteman and vocational technical schools to regular traditional high schools. Of course, we have a full academic and a full vocational staff. We have a very large special ed staff at Minuteman because of the high percentage of kids on IEPs. We're also trying to compete in the Metro West area. And that's especially true when we hire in new vocational technical teachers. We try to hire industry experts. And many times, especially in the engineering, robotics areas, they're making a pretty good salary in the private industry. And some of them are taking significant pay cuts to come into the education field. But we're trying to attract the best for our kids. Our transportation costs are high, special ed population, as I mentioned. Um, and what about vocational technical schools? They are larger than a traditional high school for the reasons I just outlined. There's some very complex spaces within a vocational high school. We have to build laboratories and shops that don't just meet MSBA requirements, but also meet industry standards. 
because the licensing and credentialing that our kids get in a vocational technical school is based upon approval by industry groups. Um, so we have to have some pretty unique and expensive places. The square footage, why is the building so big for 628 kids of a design enrollment? Well, you have to accommodate all the academic space requirements of MSBA that a traditional high school would have. And then on top of that, you add the Department of Education Chapter 74 square footage requirements. They have minimum square footage requirements for shops. They have minimum square footage requirements per student. And so all those add another 180 square foot per kid onto the 226 square feet per student that the MSBA requires. So the cost per square foot is higher, but when we look at this project on page eight and compare it to other brand new vocational schools in today's dollars, you can see that Minuteman is in the range at $562 a square foot, Essex Aggie at 477, Putnam and Springfield in the western part of the state was 567, Worcester which was almost 10 years ago if it was put into today's dollars would be almost $700 a square foot. And with today's dollars, I know T Charlie's probably going to ask me because he always reminds me how to do this. We didn't just apply a simple CPI index onto it. We actually went through the um, annual uh, construction, uh, uh, actual construction cost summaries of each year. Because in the, in the downturn there, people were opening bids and construction costs were 7 or 8 or 9 percent below what they were being scoped out when the building was being estimated. So we applied those up and downs to this today's dollars for construction. So the, the, pill, uh, the cost to the taxpayer, uh, the total project will not, it cannot exceed 144.9 million. The state share is there. The annual tax impact on the, uh, the median homeowner is between $17.50 and $117. And in Arlington, it's uh, the annual debt assessment. Our projection is be 1.2 million, and we're estimating that about $75 per uh, the median homeowner tax bill. Our next steps, once we get approval from all of our 16 towns, even though only 10 are going to remain, in July we would appoint a construction manager at risk. Uh, we're doing that because we got an extra reimbursement percentage from the MSBA if you go this route. And also it gives us some flexibility to prepare bid documents earlier and hopefully um, reduce costs or at least get more out of the building. Um, we're going to start construction a year from August at the latest, depending on the winter. If we have a winter like we did this past winter, we may be able to start earlier. September 2020, once we put a shovel in the ground, it's 24 to 28 months before the new building is, is done. And remember, we're building it in the far western end of the property, so it's not going to disrupt kids. Um, it's just going to go up, and then we all hold hands and walk over the building at some point. <laughs> Here's an artist rendering. I have more pictures on our website. We actually have some pretty cool fly-throughs and, and drone shots. Um, and, and one of the things I put in here was Charlie Baker's in the State of the Commonwealth, and he's been very generous with vocational technical education since, well, he came in. And the Minuteman is the recipient of $500,000 we uh, received a few weeks ago uh, for equipment to uh, increase our advanced manufacturing program. But we're seeing a lot of positive messaging and in his proposed budget, there's almost $83, $85 million for vocational technical education over the next five years. Um, so we think we're in a great, great place to be right now. And the other sheet has to do with the breakdown of how capital costs are assessed under the new agreement. And, and Kevin can answer questions about the, our bond assumptions and projections about um, <coughs> some of the other assumptions that went into those projections. Okay, uh, I have one quick question. The net service in this is a million six two six. Sorry, million two sixty two one ninety two. 
the debt is capital on the other sheet is about a million four. I think that includes past debt too, right? Yes, you, you see on this, if you put the page over to the second, uh, to the back side of the sheet, you can refer to it, you'll see that uh, the blue box in the, uh, on the left hand side, the ESCO lease, is about 153,000 of, uh, con of uh, current uh, debt that's, that's currently outstanding that needs to be added um, to the, uh, the, what we're projecting to be the new debt of a million 262. Um, but the building project for a total of a million 416. So do you see the million 50, uh, I'm sorry, the 153 under the ESCO debt, it's in the, underneath the blue box, the fourth column down. Yeah. And then if you go over to the second to last column under the blue box, it gives the uh, million 262, which you were referring to earlier. That is the debt associated strictly with the building project. So if you add the million two and the 153, it gives you the total of the million four. Okay, questions, Charles? I have a question for Dr. Fulton on the, just, how, how come you're so sure that the project will not exceed 144 million? Our understanding is with the, it, it simply can't. We would have to value engineer it down to that number. Um, what we bond. Who's the restriction is this, the My understanding is that it's how we bond the project as well. We're going out to bond for the full amount, which we have to under the MSBA rules. And uh, I'm committed to keeping it at 144.9. We've built in some escalation into this project. If it, if it delays much, if, if it doesn't get approved, and we, well, if it doesn't get approved, that's a whole world I don't want to think about. But the more it gets delayed, the more we're going to have to take out of the building, because we may use up that escalation. The sooner we can get going, it's one of the, the powers of having a CM at risk, is if we get our approval on May 9th, which is the last vote, I think, although I'm hearing different things, um, the CM at risk could actually be contacted earlier. We go through the process of getting them on board. We could do some bid packages this summer, uh, you know, for arrival next spring and save some money there. The reason I ask that is, you know, um, as we all know, petroleum uh, prices are unbelievably low levels yes. right now. And, and steel and concrete are also commodities <coughs> that are in the construction industry. They are very low you know, over the course of two or three years, those things have changed dramatically. And if the bids are based on current prices, uh, they're you, not. You get a 20% hit you know, over that period of time. That These period estimates time. were submitted as part of our package to MSBA under Module uh, 3, I believe, in the fall of 2015. And we didn't make any adjustments on the pricing of oil or the current pricing. We used historical pricing of the last couple of years. Skanska, our <coughs> owner's project manager, is actually concerned that there's so much building going on right now that that may be the cost driver more than the energy pricing. But we've been told this is going to be an attractive project to build because it's new construction, where it's located, um, and there aren't many new schools being built, so we're hoping for a pretty competitive bid process. Other questions? Well, uh, John? Yeah, uh, back on uh, slide three on page two, um, what accounts for the difference between the construction budget and the total project budget? Those additional costs are primarily in um, what I would call escalation costs and <coughs> contingencies. They plan in uh, construction contingencies, owner contingencies, and there are some other things not associated with construction itself. Um, I can't think of any of <coughs> Insurance bonding, oh, fees, permitting fees, um, which are outrageous in the town of Lincoln, absolutely outrageous and sinful. Um, when, once you move into the new building, what happens to the old building? Oh, that's a great question. 
<clears throat> about three years ago, the school building committee and the school committee tasked me with starting to um, look at what are the, what's the potential for repurposing the building. And that evolved into an idea of, of what's its greatest and highest use to the students and the district at large. Um, Kevin and I have uh, met with some, I would say, subject matter experts in the area of public-private partnerships and have gotten a lot of good advice about what we could do and what we cannot do there. I think, generally speaking, in the construction costs, in that 144.9, is about $4 million to demolition and remediate the building. So the building is going to be gone. Um, right, we've had several conversations with some private folks who've been using our swimming pool for many, many, many years, that they're interested in contributing, contributing money um, and establishing a, uh, an Olympic-sized swimming venue there. The town of Lexington is also interested in participating in adding more recreational and wellness space. So uh, beyond that, we've also tested the market. What that means is that we've called some developers. Uh, we've also spoken to some folks that I, I describe it as being mission compatible and campus centric. Um, as I said, one of our goals is to create a campus. So we've talked to some institutions of higher education, uh, community colleges, as well as four-year institutions that ha have expressed some interest when we get ready of having a presence on our campus. Um, I don't know if that means they want to build a building and share it or, or whatnot. But we have some great potential. I mean, if you've been to the site, I mean, I can't walk away from my career having had 66 acres off of 128 in Lexington and not maximize the, or monetize it in a way that perpetuates the school district for a lot longer. Um, and from the, so what we're intending to do, and we're going to have a meeting with some folks about this in a few weeks, um, our, our plan is once we get our MSBA funding in line, because we've been told that if you start to develop other revenue streams for the district, the MSBA in some cases have reduced their contribution based upon revenue streams that the district realizes. So we're not doing anything until this MSBA project and bonding is tied in a nice little neat bow. But when that does happen, we're going to look at um, putting out on the street requests for letters of interest from potential partners, partners who are committed to learning K through life, partners that are committed to having a campus and being a member of the campus. This superintendent has no interest in carving off a chunk and getting three million bucks for it and walking away. I don't want people on that campus that aren't committed to what we're doing and that aren't committed to the district as it remains uh, going forward. So I think I'm very excited about it. I'm looking forward to uh, exploring that some more. Like I said, we're getting some great advice from some people who've done it before with the MBTA, with MIT, with in, in the Boston area. Other questions? Um, Steven. Steven. It's a couple questions on the, the uh, slide that discusses the reimbursement of eligible costs versus the, the effective reimbursement. Yeah. What are some of the costs that, that aren't eligible for reimbursement to drive that number down? <clears throat> well, Kevin mentioned a couple of them permitting fees. Um, if you build a, a field house or a swimming pool, anything having to do with stadia, you know, seating for people. Um, there's a whole long list of ineligible costs that the MSBA um, has stuck to. I can't. Oh, administrative district offices, which is kind of weird for us because our district office is in the building, but that's not the case. And there's no real accommodation for vocational technical schools at all at the MSBA level. They're trying to figure it out as, as they go along with new vocational schools. But I think um, site development costs. What else? Oh, that's, yeah. Your site development costs are capped at 8%. So anything above that is ineligible. So in our particular site where we have 66 acres and we have a long driveway that's going to be improved and we have to bring in all of our water and sewer from Lexington 
almost three quarters of a mile, that's, we're going to exceed that 8% cap. And that's been compu uh, calculated in our estimates. But anything more than 8% and you're done. That's why in our plan, we only have one athletic field being renovated in this MSBA project. We're hoping that we'll be able to create more athletic fields with these public-private partnerships. But we had to shrink back those athletic fields. Next question, just as a point of comparison, the new building, if constructed, will have 257,000 square feet of gross floor area. What's the, the current building uh, gross floor area? It's 305,000, I believe. Have any town meetings taken any action yet? On well, as you know, in this case, no action is good action. And Lincoln took no action on the bonding on last Saturday. They were the first town meeting. Um, we'll have all town meetings completed, I believe, by the 9th of May. Thank you. Other questions? Of course, Lincoln's not going to be here mm. in the new one, so they. I, I, I had a question. Once you tear down the old building, is there any ability to carve off the gym and pool from the old building and not build a new one? Not build a new gym, the, you mean? Well, it, it, the, the, the pool and the gym are all in the, the far western side yeah. of the building. It, is there any way that you could save those from the old building and use those and reduce the project cost? We didn't look at that specifically, um, but as we go through this process of looking at repurposing and partners, some of the partners may want to look at that as part of a phase two of a project. Okay. We didn't mix it in with the existing, because when you get a pool into the mix, MSBA just, they don't want to hear anything about that. Now, won't you have to repurpose the old building site for playing fields? All that's, uh, all that's budgeted for is to take the building down, remediate it, and plant grass. Okay, so you'll need that for planting fields. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay, I might as well throw in my couple. Um, one is the building itself. I mean, I just have the architects rendering mm -hmm. of it. And I, I must count about 15 roofs. It's not as complex as that. Because it, it, it just looks like it would be an architectural masterpiece in an engineering and maintenance disaster. Uh, with, with all those roofs and connections, uh, could you just build a big rectangular building with one roof? Lovely. We could. <laughs> <laughs> Come out and see it. We'll walk it. We have it staked out yeah. now in the woods. My, my major concern with this, and sort of hearing through, mm -hmm. is that you have less than 400 students from the district. You're going to lose 40 of those. So now you're down to 345. Maybe you get 20 of them back. So now you're into 360. You've already lost a significant section of your out-of-district students because of this change in the law, which I wasn't really aware of. So you've got to get from 360, 370 to 628. Now all of a sudden, you're going to dump $9,000 of additional capital cost on top of the 17,000 tuition. So now they're going to be looking at 26, 27,000 and now the other towns, the Medfords, the Walthams, which are already thinking about building their own schools, are going to be really desperate to pull their kids out of here. Um, and uh, I, I think you're going to be in a very difficult situation to fill this reduced size school. Uh, yeah, you'll pull in some more kids because the, the school looks nice, but you've got to want to go to a vocational education. Uh, no matter what the school likes, looks like. Um, 
So if you're, if you're only filling this with 500, 550 kids, you're gonna have to reduce programs to b build a reasonable budget that the remaining towns can accept. The more you reduce the programs, the fewer kids are gonna wanna go there. And, and Minuteman ends up in a death spiral and the member towns end up with a $150 million school they're paying debt service for uh, that, that either closes or is incredibly per student expensive. I, I'm really afraid that this building project is, is too big for the size of the district we have and um, is, is, is going to really hurt that man's future. I think the school has a better chance of surviving using the, using the campus they have, uh, you know, putting a new roof on it, a few other things, and, and struggling that way. But this is $150 million, about $100 million after SBA, uh, still sorry, MSBA. It, it, it's, it's uh, you'll even have some of the member towns now paying like $24,000 per student now it's going to go up to 32, 33,000 per student, and and they're going to be wanting desperately to get out of this, um, you know, by the time this all takes place. So, how do you respond to my fears? <laughs> well, my grandmother used to say, Eddie, there's two ways you make decisions. I won't use her Irish brogue. <laughs> you make decisions out of fear or out of love. And I believe that we can increase our percentage of eighth graders applying from our member towns because we've seen it happening already. Um, if you take just, if you look at our overall eighth grade application rate, we've been pulling about three or four percent of the eighth graders from the member towns. <coughs> now with fewer member towns, we have to get up to what the average of all the other Volk schools are in a suburban environment, which is about eight to nine percent. If we're at 8 per 9 percent of our 8th grade application rate, we fill a school of 600 and something just from those 10 remaining member towns. Um, the survey we did of our guidance counselors from our member towns are seeing an increase in interest in vocational technical education. If you look at the three most recent, or if you look at all the new schools that have been built that are on that list that I gave you, within two years of opening, they all had waiting lists from their member district communities. Uh, Worcester has a waiting list of 400. Essex Aggie North Shore has a waiting list of a couple of hundred. Putnam and Springfield has a waiting list of 400. Um, so we're seeing that a new building does more than just attract a few kids. It gets people thinking about vocational education differently. Um, and the design is intended to reflect that. Um, I think there are opportunities, as I, tr as I alluded to, about monetizing the debt that's going to reduce the, uh, uh, the nut, if you will, for our member towns over the long term. I think that has tremendous potential. Um, the other piece that we haven't talked about here yet today is the um, uh, attractiveness to some larger non-member towns that do not offer any vocational technical education. Watertown, the application rate from Watertown is as strong as it ever has been. Um, I have a meeting with the mayor of Everett, our third meeting, um, in two weeks or so. Um, our application rate from Everett has doubled in the last year. They offer no vocational technical education in that city. So I think if we look at the, o the region and the needs of the region, we look at the experience of other vocational schools that have been renovated or redesigned or built new, um, and you look at the general overall interest in vocational technical education, I think we have risks, absolutely, Al. We have tremendous risks, but we have tremendous upside potential now. I don't believe for a moment that the building we have is going to have anything to do with the survival of Minuteman. The building we have now is beyond repair. The repairs alone are $106 million. If we come with MSBA and adding their 44 million in, we get a brand new building for 100 million. So, and I think when we look at the tax impact on all of our member towns, between $17 and 
The little town of Lancaster is $116 a household. Um, I think people are going to be willing to invest and uh, uh, join us in this, uh, in this process to a new Minuteman. If I can just add a couple more comments on the alternative of trying to make the existing building work. It's, as we mentioned, it's 300,000 square feet. Um, and it really is a, a very efficient building in terms of um, the utility utilization and the space allocation. Uh, given the, the vision that we have of the, um, of the academy model. And, and, and I think it's important to note, as Dr. McQuillan just said, uh, the cost of, of renovation over a seven, six or seven or eight year period will exceed what the cost of a new building project is with MSBA participation. We will, we will charge a capital fee to non-resident students as part of the MSBA uh, project. But if we have to renovate on our own, looking at five, six, or seven years out, there will be no capital fee charge because the regulation doesn't allow a capital fee to be charged unless it's an MSBA project. Number one, number two, uh, once we start hitting those, those, those certain construction levels where we hit a certain percentage of renovation, we now have to start with the fire uh, code compliance, uh, all the ADA compliance codes, so the, the, the project cost will start to escalate very quickly at, as we go into year three, year four, year five. And it, I think during that period of time, if we're trying to renovate over a two to three to five year period, Minuteman's going to be on the warrant every year looking for another bond authorization for another piece of work. And, and not only that, on top of that, it'll be very disruptive for the staff and the students. We'll, we'll be having, um, you know, seven or eight years of construction going on in the building. So I think if, if you look at the alternative of trying to make the existing building work versus the new building, from a cost side and, and, and just from uh, the, the, the learning environment, it seems to point to the new school as the favorable alternative. Thank you. Other questions? Alan? Just from a return of perspective of risk management, I guess one thing that can be said is that if, if, if there was an incremental renovation repairs of the existing building, you're only uh, uh, committing a certain level of money per year. So if something bad happens and you get into the best part that I'll talk about, you've only committed to that piece rather than committing to the entire, obligating all the towns to the entire, not um, all at once. So it, 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 even though the, at the end of the day, if everything goes well and they have cost more, uh, and not had quite as good a product, it, it certainly a, it seems to be a less risky approach. So there is, I think there's a judgment call as to how risky the, the, the current approach is. Now, um, could you just review in, in light of the uh, new regional agreement, what, what are the possibilities that of the 10 remaining towns, um, you know, say, let's say during a referendum, one voted overwhelmingly against it and the town father said, we're out of here. What, what's the mechanism? Uh, is there a mechanism for any of the other 10 towns to either drop out of the district or just sort of not be obligated to pay off the, the debt? Well, there's a, there's a technical opportunity for one of the remaining 10 to depart, but it's very, um, it, it has to do with Section 14D, Chapter 71, 16N. Let me just lay it out for you. I, mean, I don't know if you want to hear it, but the, uh, if, if um, one of the 16 member towns votes no on this um, bonding authorization vote that the school committee took a few weeks ago, then the district would be forced to go to a district-wide ballot under Chapter 7116N. In that case, we would have a, on June 18th or abouts, we would have a district-wide referendum um, the polls would be open eight hours, all on the same time, in different locations in each of the 16 towns. At the end of the day, the aggregate vote, a simple majority, would uh, inform the school committee if their authorization was approved or not. <coughs> so let's say we get that. We get the vote has been approved. Let's say one of those towns, um, Lancaster, voted no. There is a, a trigger within the new regional agreement that 
simply reflects what's in the statute, that that town could seek to withdraw from the district at that point in time. And I believe it or not, the, di the <laughs> statute says that they, if they are refused withdrawal, because now in the new agreement they have to have a majority of the towns not say no to their withdrawal, then they could stay in the district, but they would be unencumbered by that debt. However, their students would not be able to access that part of the building which was purchased with those funds. <laughs> I kid you not, this is what it's, that's how it practically works. So it doesn't work practically. So, um, but if it was a small town and they decided, and, and, and there were no students sent, then what would be their obligation? Well, we don't have any of those towns anymore, but if theoretically, if that was a town that had no students, they would have the obligation for no capital debt. So, for example, Lancaster, Wonderful. Lancaster yeah. town meeting voted against it, and then the referendum approved it. And Lancaster said, we would like to drop out. I don't know how many students Lancaster has. Yeah, and but in a small Lancaster's town, our third largest sending community. Okay, well, uh, uh, who, who's the, out of the 10? Uh, well, Bolton say, or something. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in, in a position of a town that really doesn't want to do it. Their town meetings voted it down, and they're sort of forced into it by a referendum. What are their options, and is that option uh, a big risk. I mean, could, they, could that lead to, to the death spiral? I'm, I'm very into risk management. Yes. I've learned to be. Um, I don't think the risk is that significant. If you look at the rest of the regional agreement as a whole, and if this case ever come up, obviously the lawyers would be at the table with us, but the uh, departing town has to give the district three years' notice. And so during those three years, they would be obligated. Um, until their final attempt to withdraw was denied, I don't think anything would kick in. So from a people think there's a practical way out or a practical way to stay in without paying the debt. That was never the intent of the new regional agreement. I don't think it's the intent of statute. And I don't think the commissioner would approve it because the commissioner has to approve even that. And the commissioner approved these six towns getting out in this one-time exit initial withdrawal strategy. And he was pretty clear with me, verbally anyway, that this is a one-time thing. Um, he also said some other things, but um, he doesn't expect to hear from me again, so. Okay, other questions? In, uh, in this estimate of the million 262 debt service, for the new project, how much out of district uh, capital is that assumed? If I can refer you to the one page sheet on what I'll call page two, you'll see the page numbers noted in the lower right hand corner. I'm sorry, you speak louder? Yes. The one page sheet, page two, which is noted on the lower right hand corner, this is the calculation for the <coughs> capital assessment. And if you look uh, sort of in the middle section on the right hand side, you'll see a blue bar, blue bar that indicates a capital fee calculation. And what that calculation does, it looks at the enrollment capacity of 628. It subtracts the assumed in-district enrollment of 458 students, which results in out-of-district students of 170. Now, if you take the 628 students and you divide it by the total debt that's, that's incurred by the district that year, which is $5.3 million, which you'll see in the box to the left where it says capital allocation, debt service year one, 5.3 million. You divide that by 628 students, it comes out to roughly $8,400 per student. You multiply that times the 170 students and it comes to a million four forty. That million four forty is deducted from the five point three million dollars <coughs> debt service, so that the net debt being assessed to the district is three point eight seven four. And the, the capital allocation with that reduction, the capital fee is in the box on the left hand side of that sheet as well. 
when do you anticipate financing the project? So, in other words, what year would the debt service start to hit? Well, we've, we were initially expecting full debt service to kick in in uh, fiscal 20. Uh, we'd be doing it in three bond sales. Uh, as, as Dr. Boquilla mentioned, we're looking at uh, going with a CM at risk, which will allow us to get on the street quicker with some of these bid packages. So we we're trying to capture the, the favorable market uh, and issue, issue debt in fiscal 17. We were looking at a, a second uh, bond issue 24 months later once we've, uh, uh, you know, once we've gone through our design and, and um, preliminary uh, uh, materials costs. That would be the construction phase. And then the third bond issue would be, um, we were planning on fiscal 20, depending on the schedule, the cash flow, the favorability of interest rates. That would be the final debt, uh, the borrowing. So we, we have a plan in three phases. Okay, so the first, we, you wouldn't anticipate any new debt service next year? As a matter of fact, we, we have uh, planned on 500000 in fiscal 17. That's in our budget. Okay. To be the semi-annual interest payment on the, on the first. Charlie. <clears throat> so the, the uh, if I did this calculation right, the out-of-district students would pay about $8,500 uh, per student in capital allocation? Yeah, correct. So is there any, um, you know, we heard these stories about the Department of Education lowering tuition charges or lowering the ability of, of, uh, of uh, regional districts to charge um, tuition. Is there any rule that limits how much capital you can charge them? The regulation that was adopted that we based this capital fee on was just just enacted a year ago, March. Uh, it hasn't been uh, implemented by any other regional vocational school district. In fact, they haven't even really issued the guidelines for the calculation outside of what the regulation says. But the regulation is clear that it needs to be that it needs to be calculated based on a per pupil cost. And uh, conversations that I've had with DESE indicates that the method that we're, we're using on the analysis is, is consistent with the intent. However, they haven't done it yet. We need to meet with them, who, and they will determine what that uh, capital fee will be annually as part of the uh, tuition fee as well. I mean, they could come back and say it can only be 4000 per student. There's, there isn't anything in the regulation that I saw that allows them any, any means of capping it or, or anything like that. However, we, we have to see how, how they will be uh, promulgating those, those guidelines. Thank you. Other questions? Um, okay, so you'll prob we'll probably see, do you have any sense of what kind of debt service we'll see in fiscal 18? associated with the building for fiscal 18. Um, maybe fiscal 19 may ramp up to 848,000. And then uh, the next, then the final bond issue, move it up to the million two. Okay, so for the next two years, the uh, debt service is fairly modest. Yes. When were the uh, the six towns that are weaving? Um, w will their students still be there next year? Yes. All the departing students, uh, all the departing towns, their students are held harmless. Even those that are currently in the eighth grade that are applying for admission next fall, um, they will, after next year, they're um, effective date of withdrawal is July 1st, 2017. So in FY18, they will be charged um, as much as humanly possible and as out of district students. Okay, so for fiscal 17, they just go with the standard. Yes, in fiscal they, 18, they have to have a 
municipal agreement. Intermunicipal agreement? Well, they don't necessarily have to have an intermunicipal agreement if the students who attend from those towns would attend as non-member towns. Non -member okay, students. so they'd have to pay a capital? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That'd be the purpose of an IMI, okay. is to make sure that they do pay. Okay. Are there other questions? In, in uh, your interest of uh, recruiting towns like, uh, say, Watertown, mm -hmm. okay. uh, do you anticipate that there would be any incentives given to uh, one of these new entrants so that they wouldn't have to pay the same capital um, uh, in the per rata burden that uh, the existing towns? Okay. As you recall, the regional agreement does allow the school committee to negotiate a a transitional period of time for three years where the first year they would pay 25 percent of what their capital burden would be 50 75 by the fourth year they'd be at a hundred percent of their capital burden okay are there any other questions for the superintendent or the assistant superintendent okay well uh, thank, you. thank you both for coming we really uh, we appreciate the information and the input. Be glad to answer any questions in the future. Okay. So, Thank you. is your number on the sheet? I can, you have my number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Once again, thank you. Now, uh, so the building project we will be voting, hopefully, on uh, April 13th, on that Wednesday. Uh, so this is a big deal, I think. Um, you heard fears versus hopes. Uh, where you come down, I'll have to give some thought to it. However, we can do the uh, Minuteman budget, uh, which will be Let's go someplace. It's seven. Page seven, okay. Three million six forty nine, three forty nine. Um, so they're basically using all in the E and D. Um, I didn't expect that the out of district enrollment would go down that fast, but uh, it's understandable under the new or our regulations or whatever they are. Uh, what is the will of the committee? What was Stephen? Last year? Oh, last year it was a little over four million, I believe. Yeah, the, the number came down. Um, yeah. it, it's in that first part, about four million over half. Right. So our enrollment dropped from like 150 down to 100. And, 20 or 20, well, there it is there, 152 down to 120. So it's those ups and downs that'll make huge differences. Now they won't make as much of a difference because it's a four-year rolling average. So that'll sort of smooth things up. Uh, in the short term, it probably boosted our assessment. Um, but in the long term, it'll, it'll smooth out. Okay, Stephen? I, I, I move favorable action of the 396 Second. Okay, moved and seconded for favorable action. Uh, for the assessment. Discussion. Oh, Charlie? Um. According to what uh, Kevin Mahoney said, uh, $500,000 of this budget might be used on the new building, right? So are we endorsing that new building with the explanation of that $500,000 capital? Uh, no. I wouldn't think so because they, uh, well, Stephen, you want to? What, what we try to if, if the new building doesn't go forward, that 500000 is going to be transferred to repairs and maintenance. So you can look at it as, as being neutral 
in terms of if you will either go to the existing building or uh, to the new building. Yeah. And they can't bond it without the, they can't finance it without the bond authorization. So I, I wouldn't think it would. Okay. Uh, other discussion, questions? Dean. Well, it would be more of a comment um, if we are discussing it. You know, I think um, we, we talked about this at town meeting. I guess I would, I would I would just point it out again is now that we're sort of finally operating under the um, the new regional agreement, where I think we feel like we have a better deal at this school, no matter how enrollment goes long term. That um, it, it really took a lot of years to get to the point where we are, and um, I, I think we're remiss without um, you know noting the fact that our chair and our vice chair, well, our prior chair first went up there and tried to um, get us a new agreement, and then he handed it off to Mr. Foskett, our, one of our vice chairs. And so, um, you know, I will once again sort of add my heartfelt thanks to both of them for um, at least putting us in a position where I felt like I could just sort of enjoy the presentation knowing that we have acted a lot more club next year. So, thank you. Thank you. And I will point out that our chair forgot to acknowledge himself on the floor of town meeting when he was thanking Mr. Dunn and Mr. <laughs> Foskett because he was the original person who went up there and busted his hump to get to work on this. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor of the assessment of 3,649,349, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, unanimous. 323.16. Okay. 852, let's get some other work done. Paul. If I can make a comment about the, the building, and I know we're not voting on it now, and when we vote on it, I was uh, disappointed last night, the candidates' night, when both the selectmen and the school committee candidates were asked what they thought of the Minuteman project. Um, they all said, well, we've got to do it because the building's falling apart. And I was disappointed that none of them said that having Minuteman is an asset to the town. They really do give good education that we should use. And when it comes time to present to town meeting the, the building plan, I think that's something we need to emphasize to the town meeting members. Okay. It's, uh it's going to be a complex project, mm -hmm. a project complex next couple of months. It's almost like I wish somebody would just turn it down so we don't have to get into it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's going to happen by then. Okay, uh, well, the big budget, the big item um, that's still here is the group health insurance. And we've just gotten the handout. And who's going to be presenting? Bill. Will he? Good job. No, he said he was, said he was going to be here. Yeah. I guess, I guess not. Um, Is Carolyn here? Yeah. Well, uh, Brian, you, you and I want to do this? Yeah, do you, uh, did you, I didn't bring the revised one, but I can, I can model for it. I think, I think, I think he did do some quick math. It's been, pass, it's been passed same. around. Huh? Yeah. It's, uh, it's got all the No, but this uh, hand has the wrong number in it. Uh, Sorry. <coughs> Look at the top line for the offset. Uh, no, this is the revised one. I thought that they, I could, they, they sent me a revised one with 722. Yeah, the offset, the, the offset's a different number in two different places. So I was going to ask which one is correct. They emailed it to it, but I didn't think I was presenting it. So it's like the water and sewer number here doesn't match what's in the water and sewer number. <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> well, that's fine. 
Well, why don't we just put this aside for a yeah. minute? Mm -hmm. uh, rank and recreation, can you do that? Uh, no, because Sandy just sent me the revised things at 4.30. Oh. I haven't looked at them. Okay. And Grant's not here, so we can't do water and sewer. Uh, those are the budgets left, water, sewer, insurance, and rink and recreation. Um, you know, I think we should just do this. Um, what, what is your concern is the difference between the, uh, the uh, offset of 741 and the 722 that's in the... Uh, they, sent us an, uh, they sent us a revised copy of the budget with 722 in it today. And the 576829 and the 578362 that's in the line. <coughs> so that needs to be resolved at some point. Did they send it out today, Brian? Yeah. Well, I, I, I looked at it. I said, oh, good. It's there. And unfortunately, had I known I was, I would have printed it. I have my computer. So why don't we go into something else and I'll pull this up. No, right now, that's it. There is no something. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, Dean. I make a motion. Sure. All right. So <coughs> I think I make this every year, and it's my. I, for anybody who's new, um, when we when we vote the budget, we vote exact dollar amounts, which means when anybody named Al or Alan are putting the budget books together, they see these like five dollar problems here or there on the on the budget book. They have to come back to us to vote like $10 adjustments, $1,000 adjustments, things like that, which is a complete waste of everyone's time. And so every year I've made a motion, which I'll make now, which is um, that we grant to the chair and vice chair the authority to make administrative corrections to the budget as they're putting the budget book together. <coughs> and we do not have to come here with a whole list of like little small tidbits that they have to fix and they can just get them. And the comment I always make towards it is um, if you don't have to trust the chair and the vice chair to make administrative corrections, you have a much bigger problem. <laughs> <coughs> okay, is there a second to that motion? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Dean, thank you. Uh, we'll <coughs> try to keep the changes to a minimum. Alan has been working with uh, Sandy because we want to have the five-year plan in here also uh, to uh, you know to make sure everything is sort of copacetic. Yeah, that, that, and that, that's the area that Dean's motion doesn't really correct. If there are two or three different numbers, we can't Reckon force one or the other because it breaks everything. So they really okay. need to add up. Okay. So, uh, Mary Margaret, will you will you have the rank in the uh, recreation ready for Monday? Yeah. Okay. The sewer will be ready on Monday. I'm sorry? The sewer will be ready on Monday. Okay. And water? Yeah. <laughs> Just on <laughs> the sewer. Sewer. <laughs> okay, Alan, did you see uh, those changes in water and sewer we need to make so they, they um, match? Yeah, we yeah. have. Okay. Correction. I don't want to have that question again, especially when I promised I'd fix it. Um, yeah, and I would just say, just make sure I have the most recent and accurate one and so we're so not, yeah. there's usually 12 different versions of it. We just got an updated one today, so. What's in there? Yeah. Okay, so. good. chat for a minute after the meeting about the postings for That's for next week. I think they should be pretty straightforward, but
Victoria, did you get that minute man number for the foreign article? Good. Okay. I think we have, we'll have time on Monday or, or at the worst on Wednesday to finish up. Who sent that out today? Uh... I think Karen did. I got like three or four emails from her. I can explain the confusion about the library reclassifications when Carolyn was here and I didn't know the answer because, so if anybody's interested, I can explain that anyway. Okay, go ahead. So the teen librarian was made an LS2 because of, because that's considered a technology librarian. And then the other <coughs> part that um, Carolyn mentioned I think was a misunderstanding. There wasn't a second person that was made in LS2. That was voted last year at town meeting to make that person that. So that had already existed in the budget, which is why there was no reclassification of that. It was already voted from last year. So I think that got confused. Okay. And it's just the one team librarian who's a LS2. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so um, if there's no more business on Monday, we're going to be hearing the tourism uh, article back. I'll make a new presentation of the Tourism Commission. And then we're going to hear a, a, a short, I'm going to make sure it's short, uh, on why we should pass that proclamation on local aid. Uh, then we'll do these four budgets, get them all four done. Um, and, and I'll go through everything. And, and Monday also, you should have the budgets from Alan, and I'll, I'll make copies of uh, the uh, FinCom report you know, today so people can start reviewing it. And then on Wednesday, um, we'll come in, we'll do the uh, CPA presentation. It's not long. I, I sent you uh, the Excel spreadsheets on it, so it's not really very huge. Um, and we'll, we'll vote that. and. Uh, and that should be it, except for the 13th. So, any new, any other business before the meeting? Well, I, I just like to ask you know, the, the budgets that haven't been approved yet: insurance, water, and sewer. And the other one, if you could get those to me before Monday, then I can incorporate them into the spreadsheets I'll be handing out. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I'll just be using the out of the report. Okay. Which are wrong? Yeah, I'll send. He's, I'll send you the email. He sent me the second. Okay. Whatever the latest is, I'll send by the end of the week. Okay. So yeah, if you could get those, that'd be appreciated. You won't see. So I. Um, yes. Oh yeah. Can or, or, or you can hear it on Wednesday. The rest of it. Well, it's supposed to be the new deck for the day. I suppose. Yeah. That's what it's going to be. You get a phone. You get a phone. Actually, I feel it myself sometimes. Okay. Media journal.